service and Reverie is dedicated to showcasing queer stories that truly re represent our unique voices in the world. <laughs> All right, so now that I have introduced the panel and they're actually here, <laughs> we can take you our, your questions at the end. All right. Okay, so I'm so excited and honored to be able to have this discussion with you all since queer people of color's contributions and stories have so often been overlooked and ignored, even sometimes within the gay rights movement. It's no secret that initial endeavors towards LGBTQ rights focused almost exclusively on the concerns of gays who were primarily male, decidedly white, and overwhelmingly middle class. What about the rest of us? Focusing on one faction obviously ignores the distinct needs of our diverse and unique community. 
What might you all say to allies who genuinely want to fight the good fight and seek to tell our stories, but sometimes still manage to miss the mark? Get it. <laughs> I would say uh, to analyze, um, speak up. Because that seems a lot of people do a lot of performative stunts, and, but when it comes to uh, actual movement and actual action, people are really scared. So I, I would say speak up and use your privilege to help elevate others. Yeah. Especially like, no, never mind. <laughs> oh, this works too. What'd you say? That, that might be yeah, a little bit better. Yeah, uh, right. we can pass this along. Um, you just said something, I forgot. Oh, I was talking about how, how allies can speak up and because um, there's right. a lot of performative stuff going on. So actually doing something instead of talking about doing something. Yes, thank you. So, mm -hmm. so what I've noticed, and probably a lot of us notice, is at this point, they don't listen to us. They just don't. We just sound like we're complaining or we want this or whatever the case might be. Unfortunately, we are past the point of them listening to us. And so who they will listen to is our allies uh, and using that privilege and stepping up. I mean, and it's just little things that allies can do. Um, you know, if you're in a room with, you know, white people, let's say, uh, and they say something ridiculous, like ask yourself, how do you step up in that situation? Because that's really your voice, and it sucks even me saying this, but your voice matters more if I was in that situation, because they would just think I'm super sensitive. Uh, so I would say a great opportunity for allies, just start there. I mean, you don't have to march with Black Lives Matter, we'd like for you to, um, but just start just small things that you can do because you'd be surprised like, oh wow, I didn't even think about that. You know, I'll give a story. So uh, my fiance, uh, she's white and she used to work, I don't know, it doesn't matter where the hell she used to work, but um, <laughs> there was a woman that worked with her and this black woman came in and I guess she felt like this woman was uh, trouble or she was annoying or whatever the case might be and the black woman left out and her co-worker said something on the long of the lines of oh that n-i-g-g-e-r and when she told me I was like no way I can't believe it but that was her opportunity to speak up especially because her partner is a black woman uh, so again, just little things that you can say, you know what I mean? Because sometimes I feel like white people get real comfortable where she felt like she could say that to her, which is crazy to me. So anyway, my whole point is there are little ways that you can step up uh, in a lot of facets. Can I just say, um, there's something happening in particular in, in, as far as the, the film and television industry is concerned where um, I've had a lot of uh, white celebrities reach out to me via social media and ask me how they can help. So uh, I had to like write up a proposal because now I'm a part of the, I'm like officially a part of the Time's Up movement in the branch in New York City. So that, thank you. And one of the reasons I joined was so that black women can be heard and women of color. And so they have like a small women of color sect was in that, but a lot of, um, celebrities reach out to me and they're like, how can I help? So, you know, journalism in general is very white, male dominated, and entertainment specifically. Well, one of the things that I suggested to this particular celebrity is like, well, talk to your publicist and give your publicist demands like, hey, I want these outlets at my on my project, covering my project, covering my film, and if they don't, then, or even little things like, I know one person, to, goes to outlets of color first on the press line, and we'll talk to them first, and we'll talk to them longer. Now, I know that some people may say that's division, that's discrimination, but it, it's interesting that they would reach out to me because they did. It was something they didn't notice because whiteness is so normalized, especially on red carpets and press rooms and stuff like that. that it's something that didn't occur to them until it was brought up. 
because I know some people aren't really again aren't really for call out culture. But call out culture is the reason they started to acknowledge that there was a problem. So um, people are working, but it's such a small number of them right now. But at least it's, it's progress, right? Um, yeah. Um, the, my my thing with allies is um, their their silence is literally killing people. So it's incredibly important that if you're in a space, yes, speak up, yes, say something. Even if you just say, you know, I don't agree with that, drop the mic. Like you don't, it doesn't have to be something where you're giving some sort of dissertation on how, you know, this is wrong in the history of, that's not the important part. The important part is that you stopped a person in a, in a train of thought that they were on and, and caused them to say, wait a minute, really? Not everybody agrees with, what, with, with this line of questioning or thought. So that kind of stuff is important. Um, the thing that you're saying about the, the, the press, though, that's, that, that is really interesting. And being on a board where a person can see you, because the problem is that like people move about their lives, and they don't necessarily interact in these other communities. And so therefore, not only do they know, not know that we exist, it's because they haven't seen us, so we're going to have to be more visible in order to and have conversations with allies, um, suggest books for them to read, suggest you know um, they, places where they can get the right information because the because um, speaking up is one, and it being empowered with the right information is another because um, we want them to speak up and say the right stuff. Yes. But do we want to do we want to give how much of our labor do we want to give them? I don't think is I don't see it as much as giving them our labor as it is just saying if you say that this is your your cause then represent that what you need to be reflective of what you're saying so if you're talking about a business owner then you should also hire queer people of color if you're talking about uh, movie producers or writers then some of your characters some of your actresses need to represent that diversity that you say you want. Because Dr. Dr. Bottom was in a previous time before, but like, what if people don't know for them? Like this year, can I Absolutely, so we definitely, definitely it's, it's, it's a teaching process for sure. But I think uh, there's strength in numbers and we'll do a lot better if everybody is just working together instead of seeing each other as adversaries. Um, so I want to move on to the next question, and it is, even now with the CW recently introducing TV's first black lesbian superhero, Thunder, oh, some of y'all are. Yeah, she's amazing. Um, so she's on Black Lightning. Other mainstream films have all but erased our presence. So in the movie Thor, they cut out a bisexual scene, and in the filming of Black Lightning, they also filmed a bisexual scene, and they cut it out. So the erasure is evident. Accordingly, what do you feel is your responsibility as writers and creators in ensuring representation of LGBTQ people in media? Just also a fact, and then I'll, if you uh, wanna speak on it, just a quick fact. Black Panther, which I live for, um, and has made some amazing numbers. Uh, there was supposed to be a lesbian scene with Black Panther as well. I don't know if you all knew that, uh, but that was really interesting too. Because you know, uh, yes, we can also talk about uh, you know white folks in the white community, but it happens within our own community too, where people forget that there are gay black people. Um, so anyway, I wanted to just share that fact because I thought it was really interesting, and of course it didn't, you know, didn't make it in. I just wonder how much of that was, was the director and how much of that was Marvel Disney. Um, Um, but like it's kind of like oh, we've been to the com 
on the TNCs, we've been told that comics spoke to enough people who work in Marvel, like it's kind of like this unsaid thing right now where they're just kind of like, this is, this is it. We gotta get on a box right now. We're just like not doing anymore. You can't add anymore. We're just not gonna do it for a while. Don't know when that's gonna change, hopefully soon. But right now Marvel's kind of like, uh, so I have a feeling it was probably more Marvel Disney, less what the actual directors and writers would want to do. Since they were so authentic on everything else, it's like, why would you get to this one thing and then just drop the ball? Because you know you're going to be called out. Right. I mean, look at us, we can really stand hard. Yeah, I mean, that's possible. <laughs> but I, I mean, I stand by the fact that it still happens within okay. the black community, oh, for yeah. sure, in different TV shows and different movies. But I absolutely, I didn't think about that. It did very well could have been Marvel. Um, and I think it's a discussion that we need to continue to start having the erasure of black queer identity. Um, it seems like I thought maybe after Moonlight we'd see more black men, but it's still the same sort of stereotypes as like, you know, the black gay guy who's like assisting the white woman along her journey and they're like friends or whatever, like um, the Abraham uh, King Schmidt or um, we were often paired up in interracial relationships, which is fine, I and mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but how do we advance our own narratives um, if we're always, you know, so that's why Pariah is a really good example from D. Reese is a really good um, film that sort of deals with black queer women and going through that with your family and how that how that happens. And I saw a film at Sundance called Night Comes On, which dealt with a young black queer woman who just got out of detention, a detention center. And so there's media out there. It's just, I don't know why it's not, okay, I don't know why, but it's, it isn't as widely publicized as it should be. And I don't know, I, I think, especially in Hollywood, I think they're still afraid of black women. And I, I, I think there there's a level of discomfort that comes with us being beyond maids and, and mammies and um, and who you know all the typecast roles that we have. Uh, there's still a level of discomfort. I know Black Panther has changed; it's starting to change the narrative, but it's moving real slow. Right. Like it's moving mad slow. So um, you know, there's people like. Like you and, and like I'm, I'm writing this stuff and I try to include women of color all the time, but the way the business works is very strange because if I submit my pilot script, which features a black female lead who's queer, once they get a hold of it, they can change all that. And I have no control over that. Um, because the, the it's a systemic issue, right? It's from the top down, it's still very old white men dominating these studios and businesses, and that's where, the, that's where the target is, that's where the problem is. We have to get the old, um, the dinosaurs from the homophobic era, we have to get them out, um, and we have to sort of get more women in there. You know, Lena Waithe, who's our patron saint and gay. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have her to sort of look up to, and she's definitely open to like leaving the door open for other women who look like her. Um, but we just need more of them. But see, the door was open for her because Aziz, problematic, you know, however you look at it, like, um, uh, however you look at it, it's still open the door for her. So how, how, I guess the question is how do we break those doors down too if we don't have people in our corner who have leverage, you know? I think that's a good place for the, for the conversation to be. Um, part of it is, Yes, we need to make sure that we're present in writers' rooms and in, in the places where, where the things are being created and decided. Um, that, that is a critical part of getting things together, but I mean, I'm actually a little frustrated with trying to break down a door. I'm just gonna build my own door. So my friends and I built a door. Because I'm, I'm, I'm tired of the statement, oh, well, I don't see myself represented. You got a phone, the phone's got a camera on it. There are schools, they teach you how to write stuff. Make your own stories. Start, start producing your own stories. Start, start getting your content ready because when these doors open, and they are, you need to be ready with your body of work saying, I'm already ready to go, where were you? So, and that's another reason why, like with Reverie, we are working on being able to do more originals, to be able to actually distribute, to be able to actually fund production. Um, it's it's coming right now. We're we're 
more in the licensing phase of licensing content that is already completed, which again, get your body of work together. Um, we are trying to be an answer to some of these questions that we keep asking. And I think the other part of it is, let's stop asking why we're not included, why this isn't happening, and just show up like, I, like you should have already been there. And start the conversation from, I should have already been there instead of why wasn't I here? Because honestly, they're tired of hearing it, and some of us are tired of hearing it too. Like honestly, let, 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 let's go out and do stuff. And, and walk into a room like we belong there already. What? You know, I didn't have the resources to make my own. It took me a long time to have a smartphone. Uh, I grew up poor, so I didn't have much. Um, so I don't wanna put that pressure on people because it may not be accessible to them, as, as, as accessible as we think. And so the, pro the problem with um, black queer representation, and I think just black women in general in this business is the lack of access and opportunity to get to 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 where they need to be. Like if you have a phone and you know you have YouTube, sure, go create it and work on it for eight, nine years, however long you want to work on it until somebody discovers you. But there is something to be said about contacts and using leverage. And we can you can create your own door. You can bust down other people's doors. You, they, you know, there are just different ways to go about it, and I don't want people to think that something happening where they want their, they're struggling for their content to go viral, and then they're at YouTube shooting up the place. Like that's not like and I know that that's a street an extreme example, but I think um, we have to sort of be careful and in, in the information that we give people make them make sure that they know that there are, are several options instead of just one. And we have to meet people where they're at. If they don't have access to certain things, then we can help each other and help them sort of get there. Uh, I think that that's the biggest thing is, like what you were saying before, is that sometimes we do it to ourselves and people get access to information and they hold it. And look, if you wanna do that, that's fine, but that shit comes back around. <laughs> Because I've been guilty of doing it at the beginning. And it comes back to haunt you. And so I think the biggest thing is, is, is access and opportunity and being okay with sharing the connections and being okay with not getting something out of other people's success. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes. Yes. Now you said we, I want to be very clear, like we coming together, do you mean like we need other people to step up or other queer black women to come together? What, I just want to be clear when um, you say we. I, I think black women across the intersections. I would like for us to be more open with one another. Um, oh, okay. Okay. My mind's 
Sounds nice. No? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, creators, since most movies and books and magazines are designed to appeal to as large of an audience as possible, many may fear that centering on queer people of color and their specific issues and themes could risk offending a significant portion of the audience not to mention potential investors. Best Picture Oscar awarded film, Moonlight, was one of the lowest grossing awardees ever, bringing in only 22 million compared to the 152 million by Hidden Figures the year before, and 178 million by um, Brokeback Mountain, actually. So what is the solution, and how have you managed to combat this and still come out on top? I'm sorry, like I, I'm not trying to dominate the discussion and if you want to talk. I, I, I think we have to understand how movie money works. Moonlight was filmed on a $1 million budget and made triple its budget. Right. So that's amazing, right? Um, and Moonlight was marketed as an indie film project. And so just the district, you know, look at the district. It like made money internationally. And so I think there has to be an understanding about how, because Hidden Figures is a big budget production, and so it made a ton of money because they paid right. a ton of money to make it. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that we have to sort of understand how movie money works and, and learn not just creatively, we have to learn the business. And I think that that's something that's holding back black queer representation is people don't know about money. Right. When you know how to navigate, like I know people who are not created at all, but they constantly get money. They know where to go get it, you know, the right people to talk to. And I was like, I need to be, with, I know I can write, I need to be with those people. So I can get money for my projects and stuff like that. So that's pretty much the question, like, who are these people that they know? Like, what is it? What is the trick? What is the trick to getting this funding or getting this distribution? And, and, and I think it also points out that there might be some discrimination against specifically queer people of color, how do you combat this and say, well, we're only kind of targeting a small portion of the population, what's the trick to still getting it done and still being successful? So I'm absolutely going to give credit where credit is due. I was in an ally panel at noon. Uh, Leah, who's right here, you had a really great statement that you made, and I think it's a great way to combat in any situation, is to have those facts and figures. To be able to say and present something and say, hey, you should have queer black content because Moonlight was made on a million dollar budget and it made $22 million. Do you get what I'm saying? To be able to give those facts and figures, and that's brilliant, and bring that to people, I think in a way, I'm not saying we'll solve everything, but I think it's a start to combat, um, I guess, the invisibility of queer black people in film and on TV. So are there like specific organizations that you all work with? If there are creators out here now that say, I wanna, produ I wanna produce something, I wanna create something, how can I find funding when I'm appealing to such a small portion of the population? Um, I, I want to add this thing really quick too. About, like, okay, so because they're partying over there. Um, so the new Apple TV came out, and one of our co-founders went and got it, and we were sitting around, gay, lesbian. By trans transgender, LGBTQ, nothing. So that's November-ish, 2015. So we said, you know what? Let's 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 build something so that when we type this in, something will come up. So we did friends and family um, raising of funds. Um, obviously, crowdfunding is something that people are doing, but because we were building a company, crowdfunding was not the option that we needed because that's entirely too many people on, in the boardroom to have to answer to, and we had a very specific vision for how we wanted to start start this company and how, what we wanted the company to do, and when you crowdfund, um, those people are also in the room with you. It's not the same thing as just regular investors. 
Um, our CEO went around and pitched to um, Gangel groups. There are Gangel groups in pretty much every city. Um, basically, um, VC venture capitalists are looking for certain types of um, businesses to fund. Um, the Small Business Administration does funding, and as far as like how do you get your content made from that, basically we put together a content budget through our through our raising of money, and because um, creating new content is a part of our business model, it directly relates to us being able to use funds to do a show or to do a premiere for um, Bob the Drag Queen's um, comedy special at Outfest. So a portion, portion of, our, of our money can go towards that so that we can bring out this piece of content because we raised money and said that we were gonna be spending it in this way. So it's friends and family, it's community, it's crowdfunding, it's um, looking for grants and loans from the Small Business Administration or other organizations and grants and groups. Um, it's making sure that like you are, keep talking to people that make stuff. Keep talking to people that have access because they will drop a nugget and you'll be like, you know what? That will work for me. So I'm like, somebody has your information, you just have to keep talking to people and find it. Um, those, if you're an introvert and you're into this business, you gotta get over it because the networking is a huge part of why I've been successful. I tell people that I think I'm, I'm a, I'm from New York, I'm from the Bronx, that's what I do, I hustle and whatever, but I think I'm a better networker and negotiator than I am a writer, and that has what has, that is what has allowed me to sort of elevate my platform. What I'm struggling with now is how do I continue this and not, you know, not have to go into code switching and having to change who I am to get